Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, today, this is the third in a lecture series looking at power and power dynamics, specifically with the lens of working with asylum seeking immigrants. Um, this uh, working with asylum seeking immigrants, people who've survived torture, gave me a particular interest in combining psychology and critical theory because I felt that the traditional ideas of psychology were inadequate uh, in the work that I was doing. And I also did my dissertation on um, therapist reflections on shortcomings in their training when they were actually working with survivors of torture. So a lot of this project is kind of my attempts to draw outside of psychology to educate myself uh, so that I can do better, more critical work with um, survivors of torture, refugees and asylum seeking immigrants. So um, the goals of today, we're going to uh, talk about the social and psychological impacts of language, the role of language within discourse, and situate and critique situate ourselves and, and try to arrive at a uh, critique of, of our work and our situatedness vis-a-vis -vis the person that we're working with. And of course, I'm speaking from the perspective of a, a mental health professional, but I think that this is also relevant to people who are educators, lawyers, doctors, artists, activists, um, anyone who's kind of coming in, in contact with someone who they're hoping to help or assist in some way that has the potential to be uh, asymmetric in its power dynamic. So, um, so I wanted to just start with this um, relatively, relatively simple uh, description by Foucault. I don't know how many people in here have read Foucault or are familiar with Foucault, um, but he can be very difficult to understand, but I, I found this in all of my searches, I found this very kind of clear statement by, his, by him, uh, which as you can see, power, this idea that power organizes and explains human experience. So how can we try to wrap our minds around that and understand exactly what he means by that? Um, in, in this lecture specifically, I'm gonna be looking at the way that power, that, that language, it is through language that power organizes and explains human experiences. I think he saw that there are a variety of ways that power could do this, but language was a really, really big area where you would see this phenomenon. So the outline of today, we're going to review the last uh, talk two weeks ago pretty quickly. And then we're going to kind of start maybe a little bit in within our comfort zone. We're going to talk about language within a Western context as maybe we might experience it on a daily basis. And then we're going to talk about, um, because several people last time brought up this idea of using interpreters. In, um, it was actually quite a few people last time. So I thought that it would be good to bring that, of course, into this topic on language. And then um, we're going to look at this definition of discourse that's going to take up the whole screen. And we're going to look at it very carefully and uh, try to examine and dissect what it's saying with concrete examples. I'm hoping it'll make really clear this definition of discourse. And then we're going to talk about a trauma, uh, the, the limitations of language to describe traumatic experiences, but also uh, some, um, something called the testimony method, which came from Chile during Pinochet's regime that was used to actually help empower people who are victims of torture. So it's kind of scrutinizing from different ways the focus on the linguistic narrative as it comes to describe torture and trauma. And then we're going to compare two therapy excerpts uh, from my study, from my dissertation research, two very, very different examples of, uh, the, of language, of, whether, of, of how language was used and whether it was even used whatsoever. And then at the end, uh, the reflections and, and conclusions of today. So just to talk <laughs> briefly about the last lecture, the last lecture we were talking about power dynamics in the therapy session and specifically looking at these moments in therapy with survivors of torture where the uh, therapist felt suddenly jolted or surprised by some kind of material that came up from the survivor and then they didn't really know how to proceed. 
And so uh, we looked at the way that the therapist used the relative position of power to navigate either into the trauma narrative or away from it, kind of coming back to a sense of normalcy and control uh, within the therapy session. So it was just looking at, we're looking at power manifestations in very different ways across these four lectures. So we'll start now with uh, language within a Western context. So I think that this, what I'm about to say, I think is pretty probably intuitive for most people. Um, language is something that we use to form our identities. It's much easier to get an, a sense of who, who we are when we're talking with other people in a social context. We use words, we use language to, to create what's, what I, what's called this internal working model of the self. Is anybody familiar with this term, the internal working model? So it's kind of this idea that, um, and, and it also relates to the, the neurological uh, description that I'm gonna give in a second. But the internal working model of the self is just kind of this never ending working idea of what your identity is. And it's very much informed by the way other people might see you and the way that you see yourself as separate from other people. And that we create this uh, working model and we refine it through the use of language. And of course, we do this with other people and with our worldview in general. So neurologically, are people, cons are people familiar with the concept of reconsolidation? So reconsolidation is this uh, kind of looking into the neuroscience of memory and identity. It has to do with every time you talk about something, every time you conjure up a memory with words in a social context, you are making physical changes to that memory and then kind of recoding it and putting it back in your mind. So it's actually changing the memory. Every time you talk about a memory, you're changing it and then you're storing it back again. And this also applies to this internal working model, which is essentially a, a working memory of the self. So this is just talking first a little bit about how language is important to all of us in, in daily life. So in going to, and uh, just revisiting some of what we talked about last time with interpretation, what I'm referring to here is, of course, working with interpreters. So often when you're doing therapy with asylum-seeking immigrants, refugees, it's not, rarely is it that it's just you and the asylum-seeking immigrant. Usually there's no common language, and so you need an interpreter. And um, oftentimes there can be, thank you, <laughs> there can be um, logistical concerns with, with interpreters. Sometimes the communication of constructs that just don't exist in, in the other language fail to be communicated. Uh, for instance, if you're trying to ask uh, a, a refugee, I'm gonna kind of use these terms interchangeably, refugee, asylum-seeking immigrant, um, if you're, even though they're, they're very different, actually. But if you're working with uh, someone who's an asylum-seeking immigrant and you're trying to ask them, you're trying to do an assessment, a psychological assessment where you're asking them, have you had periods of enormous energy, that unbounded energy that you just couldn't calm down and rest? Or if you're asking about um, depression or if you're asking about do you see things that other people don't see? These concepts that we kind of take for granted as Western clinicians are, can sometimes be very um, not easily translated, not because of lack of language, but because the constructs just don't exist in the other culture. So that's kind of one example of things that can be tricky with using interpreters. But there's also the... Uh, the survivor's relationship to the language. And we talked a little bit last time about whether uh, the language that the interpreter is using with the immigrant is a, a colonizing language. There might be, there might have been a, a history of colonization um, in the ex experience of the person who's coming to a therapy session. So I uh, found something actually really interesting a description by Franz Fanon, are people familiar with Franz Fanon? 
So he is, of course, um, an Afro-Caribbean, was an Afro-Caribbean psychiatrist who had uh, a lot to say about um, anti-colonial struggles and even just um, struggle to define oneself and define one's own humanity as a colonized subject. But he writes here in um, Black Skin, White Masks, he writes here specifically about the topic of language and the, the, the kind of relatedness as the colonized uh, subject to the language of the, the colonizer. So in this case, it would be French. So he says, so he will come closer to being a real human being in direct ratio to his mastery of the French language. A man who has language consequently possesses the world expressed and implied by that language. What we are getting at becomes plain. Mastery of a language affords remarkable power. Paul Valéry knew this, for he called language the god gone astray in the flesh. Every colonized people, in other words, every people in whose soul an inferiority complex has been created by the death and burial of its local cultural originality, finds itself face to face with the language of the civilizing nation, that is, with the culture of the mother country. The colonized is elevated above his jungle status in proportion to his adoption of the mother country's cultural standards. He becomes whiter as he renounces his blackness, his jungle. So it's very, uh, obviously very provocative, very evocative language uh, that where he's describing the experience from his own experience describing what uh, is happening in the mind of, quote, the other, the, the concept of the other, when coming into contact with somebody from the colonizing country. So I think this was, this is just kind of adds another layer of complexity to the in interpreter triad, I think we were saying last time, so was the therapist, the interpreter, and the client. This adds kind of another layer of psychological complexity in, in the dynamic of the three. Um, so I, I think that it's just, the language is, is of course such a broad topic and it's hard to choose which particular things to focus on when it comes to language, but I think this is actually pretty unique and important to bring this into this particular context. So now we're going to approach the definition of discourse. As I promised, it's, it's filling up the entire screen. I bold-faced parts of it that I want us to really focus on and that we're going to um, come back to and kind of emphasize throughout the talk. So I'm just going to read it, and you guys can read with me. So discourse is a means of both producing and organizing meaning within a social context. Language is thus a key notion within this view, for it is language which embodies discourses. As such, discourses systematically organize human experience of the social world in language and thereby constitute modes of knowledge. A key function of a discursive formation on this view is not merely its inclusive role, but also its exclusive role. Discursive formations provide rules of justification for what counts as knowledge within a particular context and what does not count as knowledge in that context. On Foucault's account, it follows that the realm of discourse can have a repressive function. Okay, so we've been, the first lecture we talked about different definitions of power. I, I, not necessarily trying to favor one definition over the other. So this, I'm trying to complicate our ideas of how we think of power. Typically, I think on a daily basis, a lot of us think of power as the ability to, to repress or the ability to, to access things that we need for ourselves. But then Foucault really opens up this definition and, and thinks about power neutrally. He's, he describes it from a place of neutrality but then the way that it's used, it kind of like, like money, the way that it's used can be used for, for evil, essentially. So 
Um, so the other thing that I, I think is really important in this definition is you see that I've bold-faced um, the idea of the inclusion and the exclusion. So Foucault also talked about this, the idea of the truth producing regime. So the idea that uh, people who are able to contribute to these sort of dominant discourses, these ways of thinking about the world, that we belong to this truth producing regime as opposed to people who we would characterize as the other or the subaltern. So we have this kind of unique access uh, that, that other people don't have and that we're invested in, in having this at the expense of other people not having it. Um, and so I think that uh, this, and, and of course when we're kind of when we're just working within Western contexts and we're working with other people who also come from Western contexts, it can be easy to take this for granted, I think, because we're kind of both, we're, we're not working with the subaltern. We're both working within um, this truth, uh, truth producing regime, so to speak. Um, so, but then when we're working with people who are coming, trying to seek asylum, um, who, are, who, are, uh, who are refugees, it's a very different picture. And so I think that um, we're not really prepared in a lot of ways to know how to be in a, a, a mostly a, a talk therapy kind of situation, a, a situation that really focuses on language, how we're going to do that in a fair way with people who have not been part of this, part of our regime, part of this truth producing regime? How do we sit and do that in, in, a, in a way that's going to lead to emancipation or, or to liberation of the, of the client um, or the survivor? Um, okay. So uh, this next part that I'm talking about is, speaks, all, speaks a little bit more to the idea of um, the excluded and the included knowledges. So oftentimes when, when I was working with, uh, with people who had, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, multiple systems of oppression that they were struggling under, um, I remember working with this man in particular, who's a gay man of color, uh, had been um, really disadvantaged by gentrification, had been abused as a child, a lot of different kinds of abuse growing up. And he came into me, uh, he came into the session, into my, into my office, and he was kind of talking about um, saying that, you know, he had this really, it was very, very difficult for me to listen to sometimes. It was ha having this discourse about him being gay. Um, where he was saying that, you know, he was also, um, he was gay because of some abuse that had happened to him and that he really internalized this idea that his mother had taught him about being um, wrong for being gay. Just a lot of internalized homophobia. And it wasn't even... And so I, of course, kind of situate myself completely opposite of that, and I, and I wanted in some ways to tell him, you know, to almost replace that, to displace that narrative with, with another one, saying that, you know, homosexuality is a natural variant of human sexuality, etc. cetera. Um, but it was not possible, it's not possible to displace a narrative because, uh, I think that he had been, he had lived his life being, having this knowledge, being kind of this member of this disqualified person where his narrative, his knowledge was never privileged enough to create a discourse, to be part of the discourse. And it wasn't possible for me to just replace his narrative that he had internalized with my own. He had to, he had to basically really find his own narrative within that context. I couldn't give it to him. So it had to really come from him, him himself. Um, so I think even though that we sometimes feel a, a very strong draw to liberate another person, it's not possible to do that in, in a lot of situations because I think because of this idea of you need to be part of the creative process of adding to this discourse if you're going to find your own liberation. 
So I think that's just a, a, an important um, part to the dominant, uh, important part to the discourse. Um, okay. So now we're going to talk about, we're going to go, we've talked about this before in the last few lectures where we talk about trauma and PTSD and all these different um, diagnoses and the, the power of a diagnosis. Do people get what I've put up here, big T, little t? So it's this idea of um, major trauma versus not really trauma, versus kind of traumatic, but not in the way that capital T trauma is very, very traumatic. And so we make this kind of binary between what real trauma is and what not real trauma is. Um, so uh, I'm gonna give another, ex another clinical example. Um, this woman that I was working with, um, she had a very, she had experienced a lot of domestic violence, um, she had a very difficult time kind of describing her own experience. But at one point, I, I think what I, what I had been doing with her was I was trying to instruct her, trying to teach her that she had this diagnosis of PTSD. So I became very focused on the diagnosis because I felt that it was a way of validate, validating the extreme experience that, he, that she had gone through. And, uh, but I think that the risk of giving this diagnosis is that I am basically giving her, um, we talked about at the beginning, kind of when we talk about language and identity formation, the fact that I have told her, told her repeatedly and told her um, that she has this diagnosis of PTSD. She began, that was one of the only things that she was able to retain from the therapy, from session to session, she remembered, I said, you have this condition that's like what people who've gone to war have. It's called PTSD. And that became kind of part of her identity. And I still, I think I'll always think of that choice of intervention um, as somewhat problematic because that idea is now really implanted in her mind. She really is kind of like, oh, I'm this person. I'm like, a, I'm like a combat veteran. She has this narrative now that she's internalized. And, um, and I think that that's, uh, I think that if I'd been a little bit more critical, I would try to find other ways to validate her experience or to help her describe her own experience without having to use this kind of language. So I don't know how the rest of you all feel about this, but um, when we talk about, in a, in a clinical context, people who have experienced trauma versus people who have not experienced trauma, we put a lot of emphasis on really distinguishing what is real trauma versus not real trauma, or what really warrants a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder versus not post-traumatic stress disorder. And I feel that there is, when you hear someone who has experienced trauma and you say, this is a trauma, this is a PTSD, there's always this kind of gravitas, there's always this weight that goes with the acknowledgement that something is really traumatic and really post-traumatic stress disorder. It always takes, it's always, it comes with it just a, 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 just a sinking appreciation of what the person went through. And the reason why I'm talking about these is because I think that feeling, that feeling of just knowing, okay, this person, this person really did experience capital T trauma, this person really does have PTSD, I think that is a felt experience of this power that we're talking about. So in all of these, I'm, I'm trying to really understand and pin down what, what this discursive this power is. And I think that in this situation, I think in talking about trauma, I think that this feeling and this kind of appreciation of something that's so horrible that happened that earned this label, it kind of makes us appreciate something more than when it, when it isn't actually considered traumatic or PTSD. So it's a sign that something is carrying power, is carrying weight with it. Does anybody have any questions at this point on any of this? People can ask questions throughout if you like. Okay. So, and the other thing about PTSD also is that I think it tends to, uh, you know, people talk about um, feeling, I think it came up the last time or maybe the first time people talked about feeling that PTSD is stigmatizing 
but, and I see it really in a different way. Um, one of the risks of PTSD having this kind of power, this linguistic power, is that they, people who don't have the diagnosis often feel invalidated by not being diagnosed with PTSD. So even though they've experienced what they've experienced and they've been impacted by it, if they don't have, at the end, this final label of PTSD, there's something that's invalidated about all of their experiences. And so I think this is just speaking to, um, you know, whether we kind of use these, these terms or not in our professional lives or daily lives, I think it's very important to understand that we, this, th these things that we take for granted can actually have such a defining impact on somebody's identity. Mm -hmm. That they've had trauma. Yeah, that they have trauma, but maybe not, not, not PTSD in order to like, validate that. I think so. I think definitely. I think, and, and actually, it, even the term trauma is problematic, though, and I think, because it, it, people, how, how then if somebody, what if somebody isn't really interested in focusing on anything uh, like like the damage like any kind of damage oriented stuff but they're kind of thinking like I went I survived through I survived this terrible experience and these are the, the ways that I resisted I used this example on the first talk about um, people about uh, these um, people who were resisting and um, they're in the Gaza Strip and they were they were resisting and rock throwers and they were um, they would at night, uh, so every day they would do this, but then at night they would, they would wet their beds every night. And the mother of these kids would basically kind of talk to the humanitarian aid psychiatrist who came by and basically said, oh, you know, my, my, my children are wetting the beds. And the psychiatrist took that to mean that they, were, that they were traumatized. And so suddenly this very complex identity that they had as, as resistors was really just flattened to this idea of trauma. And so they were represented as traumatized individuals. And so I think I'm not necessarily saying that, that trauma is maybe, I mean, it, it's just, it's, the problem with it is that we're just so stuck in using these, what we believe to be these very important signifiers of someone's experience that we're not even imagining how much this, how much space these ideas take, how much space these ideas take up in, 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 in the room, in someone's consciousness, so that um, they don't have the chance, they don't have the capacity or the capability. We believe that they don't have the capability to describe their own experience and speak about what it is. But I think, though, in some situations where if you, you know, if you feel like someone would be validated by, by acknowledging something as traumatic, then then that's a different situation. But I think it really can be applied variously, independently. Um, and also, I mean, what happens when someone has a diagnosis of PTSD? Are they like everybody else with PTSD? Are they suddenly, or like everybody else with trauma? Um, I think this is kind of this, also this blanketing uh, power of, of this discourse. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about now the trauma narrative. Um, so again, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there are, there are a few distinct camps when it comes to trauma healing. Uh, there are the camps that believe that the goal of trauma treatment, and I think that always sounds funny, trauma treatment, um, the goal of trauma healing recovery is to be able to master the trauma narrative, to be able to say what happened to you without scrambling up the order of things, without getting distracted by memories, but having a very clean, relatively easy to follow narrative of the trauma. Um, so you have a lot of big names in, in trauma treatment. Um, Edward Edna Foa, 
um, and Judith Herman, who both kind of talk about the way that you describe the client, you know that they've described their trauma adequately if you can see it like a movie in your mind. It has to be that clear and crisp of a, of a description. So it's this really focus, like laser-like focus on the words, on the, on, the, on the trauma narrative. But then you have Van der Kolk. I think a lot of people are familiar with him. He wrote um, The Body Keeps the Score, which is basically this idea that trauma is, is embedded in non-linguistic parts of the brain. Trauma is embedded in the body. Um, it's embedded in ways that you can't kind of patch back together with just language. So he utilizes all these different approaches to trauma healing. So, and, and they actually, I, I was reading a little bit more about them and Van der Kolk gets a lot of criticism from FOA, like a lot of, um, is very much discounted by FOA. So that's kind of the importance of, or the, really the, the extremes of these two camps. Um, I have uh, myself done conducted narrative exposure therapy with a, a asylum seeking, a survivor of torture, and it was grueling. It was, um, she, the, the idea, the way that it's set up is that you have somebody come in and you talk about, you know, the idea is there's a, there's a lifeline and that you talk about the, maybe the day before the torture, like what did you do on that day? And then you talk about the day after the, the, the day it was all over. And you basically, on each subsequent session, you fill in like bit by bit by bit by bit. You fill it in until you get to here would be the, the torture. Here would be the, the kind of the idea of the, the most intense part of the trauma. And oftentimes these narratives are very important for legal reasons. We talked about on the first, the first lecture, the importance of writing down what happened to you so that you can prove that, um, that, you, were, that you experienced torture and that you know, often goes along with the diagnosis of PTSD and these things fit together very well. And then you can give them to the lawyer and the judge and they say, okay, this is very clear that you have been traumatized and, and that you have PTSD, so we're gonna grant you asylum. So this narrative plays a very important legal role. Um, but just thinking about it uh, therapeutically, um, this, this experience can be, uh, it takes an enormous amount of work from everybody um, and it is very, very emotionally demanding um, and very intellectually demanding. So, um, so I, but, but I think that sometimes, I think most people, I think most people do tend to approach trauma with um, talk therapy or trauma-informed therapies that are mostly speaking talk-based. Um, but that that's changing a little bit, but I think most of it is, is talk therapy. So, um, and I think that even, there's even this pull when you're in a therapy session to wait for the trauma narrative. When is it gonna come? You're always listening for it. Uh, you're always wondering when the person is going to kind of arrive at their trauma. So it takes up, the, the idea of the trauma narrative itself takes up a lot of space in, in the mind of the therapist. Um, and so narrative, narrative exposure therapy is, is what I described with this kind of filling in uh, gradually to the, to the trauma experience. So the testimony method is uh, this method that was developed in Chile during um, Pinochet, or after Pinochet's um, rule. And uh, it was done with uh, the people, the, the torture survivors uh, who suffered under his regime. And basically, uh, the idea was, was writing the narrative, was audio recording the narrative, transcribing it, and then signing it. But then it had a political component where you would go into an assembly space, and then you would read the trauma. You would read what you had written. And then it would, the idea was that it would, all of these trauma narratives would accumulate into their own history of what happened under his regime. Um, and, and of course, the idea was that it was, it was meant to empower uh, the people to speak about their experiences and return power to the survivor. So I think that, I think that really this focus on 
language, I think it has, it can have political dimensions and be useful in that way. Um, but not everybody's interested in, ha in kind of politicizing their experiences. Some people are, are just suffering and, they, and they, want, they want to heal from their experiences. Um, okay. So now we're going to look at a couple of examples from my dissertation research. Um, this first one, um, there are two very different examples. So one of them is, uh, they're both looking at therapy sessions with asylum-seeking immigrants. But in this first one, uh, this therapist was speaking actually very openly about his feeling of power and language as a therapist. So uh, we're just going to read, read this one real quick. So I think probably language would be one of the power differences in that I have, because of my education, I have access to all this clinical language that helps me attempt to explain sometimes multiple feelings, or I can use certain clinical language to summarize his thoughts into a single word. Sometimes the way I talk might not make sense to him because I'm using clinical words that are not really relevant like they just show power and that I have this knowledge and he's trying to explain it to me from a different perspective. I think this really aligns almost perfectly with this description of um, discourse in the beginning. Um, so it's really kind of illustrating this idea that um, it's not so much about the healing process, it's not, it's mostly about being able to really master the use of jargon, being able to really describe what the other person is experiencing, being able to basically translate all of these experiences, and he says into a single word. That always strikes me, that part right there. Um, it reminds me of, I think it's Superman or something, like in a single bound or running, jumping across buildings, I don't know. But it reminds me of that a little bit. Um, so, um, so that, was one ex uh, so that was one example, kind of one extreme example of, of the use of, of power in, in therapy. Um, this next one, was yes? He was, I think he was starting to, he was starting to kind of develop an awareness of it. I think in that moment, he was like, oh, I hadn't really named it that way. I hadn't really seen it that way before. But, um, but this is actually what was happening. It was almost, this, the therapy, I mean, the therapy I did, the, the research I did was sometimes it felt like supervision, like I was kind of supervising therapists in their work. So these kinds of things often come out mostly when you're talking about them after the session's over. Um, so this next example I'm going to give I'll set up what happened here. So this is, as it says, the absence of language. So she, uh, she was at this, there's this center that this is actually, she worked where, where I also worked in New York, um, the program for survivors of torture at Bellevue. And um, she was oftentimes, we had access to interpreters um, who spoke every language, every language in the world. Um, it was this vast network of interpreters that the New York City hospitals have. And so she was on the phone with the, with the interpreter and, um, and she had the client there. And the client was talking about, for the first time, talking about um, seeing, his, seeing his mother and his wife being sexually assaulted because of his political activity. Um, he had been a longtime activist in his country and it was, and, and he was, and he was sat, he was sat in the room to watch. So, and oftentimes, I mean, this is, the, I mean, you can kind of imagine the level of, of um, turmoil that you would experience seeing something like that. But he, he was describing it for the first time. Oftentimes, people would not have had the chance to talk about what happened to them or what they saw or their torture until they got to um, the therapist session. So it was is this kind of story that was that was inside that that hadn't ever emerged before. 
And so he came in, and so he was, he was talking about what happened, and, the, and with interpretation, it's always kind of halting. Everything is multiplied by two. Um, so he talks about what happened to him and about the rape, and then the phone line drops. And that was the first time he had ever talked about what happened to him, and the phone line dropped. And they had no language, no language anymore. So how... What do you do? So he, what he did was he actually fell out of his chair. He fell out of his chair sobbing on the ground and was uncontrollably full of, he was reliving it. He was, he was feeling all these things that he had allowed to come out. He was feeling them, but with no way of using language at that moment in a way and in a way, I, 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 I'm not sure how much... I mean, she, the therapist, the therapist felt really overwhelmed at first. Like, what do I do? I have no way of communicating to this person. I have no way of using my words to contain their experience, to soothe them. I have no way of validating what they've said. I've had no way of, you know, giving psychoeducation. You know, for example, all people who've had these experiences, you know, maybe aren't sleeping well, blah, blah, blah. She had none, access to none of that, none of that anymore. So there was no language. It was just, it was just two people, two feeling people. And so what she did was she actually had a, a background in theater and she kind of just went into a different mode and sat on the floor with him was there with him, gave him tissues, gave him water, and just sat with him and didn't know what was going to happen in the next moment, but was just a, there accompanying him. And, um, and then eventually, eventually he, he took out his phone and he found pictures of his mother and his wife, and he showed her the pictures. And he had the strength, they both had the strength to get back up in their chairs again. Um, but so she reflected on this experience, and we're going to read what she said about that. So there is something about this space, the therapy space, and telling a story, and being there, and having somebody listening who wasn't going to turn it around on him. And I think that was powerful enough for him to be able to fall apart. There was something important about not having language in that moment. The affect kind of gets contained by language, and then, when there's no language, there's nothing to hold together or to sort of signify anything. And so you're just left with this feeling of whatever it is, and the feeling is obviously really intense when you're dealing with somebody who's had these experiences. And so I just have thought a lot about what language does and how it can be both liberating in a lot of ways, but also sort of keep affect from being felt in certain moments. So she's kind of saying that there was something cathartic almost about not having language anymore that allowed him to really quickly access this, this well of pain, but to not be alone with it. And that there was nothing she had to say to accompany him, to make him not feel alone in that. Um, so she experienced that as very much a joining moment with the client. So... Uh, yeah, any other reflections on, on this? Any other um, impressions that people have or ideas about what the role of losing language in that moment? It's okay. Okay, so reflecting on our roles. So I have a lot to say here in, with respect to our roles as, you know, I can speak to my own as a therapist. All of, this, all of this research I've done, all of this kind of looking at critical theory that I've done, I really, in a way, it's kind of put me into my own existential crisis. I don't really know what I should offer anymore. I'm not as confident about should I, you know, really frame things in terms of trauma and PTSD? Should I keep doing that? Or is there a better way? Um, so it's making me kind of think more critically about what I'm doing. But it's very hard, it's very challenging because it's what's there then, what do I do? Um, but I mean, the question that I return to is what, what is our role um, in the liberation 
of, of people who've experienced oppression, of people who are thought of as the other, of the subaltern. What, what we, should we even be in contact with them? What is our, what, what do we do? How can we possibly do anything useful without continuing to perpetuate this kind of oppressive um, space filling uh, dynamic with, with someone? Um, so it's really, it's, it's upsetting a lot of assumptions, which I think is kind of the point of this stuff and, and probably why a lot of psychology education doesn't include this. Um, just my own kind of guess. Um, but uh, it brings me to another example I had with um, this person who I was working with who had, and this is from my own experience working at the same clinic. So he had, uh, this person was basically, it's a very simple uh, description. He had been working, um, he was trying to get asylum. He had been working in, for, this, for this carpenter. He'd been working as a carpenter for some time. And at some point or another, he said that he had gotten he had gotten a splinter, and the splinter was so bad that he, he it, was, it was so deeply lodged in his skin that he couldn't go to work anymore. And he was trying to tell his boss, you know, I'm, I'm really in a lot of pain. I think, I think I have something wrong with my hand. And the boss was like, I didn't see it. I, I don't see any splinter. You have to go to work or I'm firing you. And there was no way for him to explain or to convince his boss that he was really struggling, that he was really in pain. Um, and, but that one day he was on his way to work and he was riding in the, in the truck and this splinter emerged. It just came out of his finger. It just emerged on its own. And he, he took that splinter and he saved it. He put it in a little vial, like in a little glass vial to bring to me, to show me in the session. And he, he just wanted, I, I think there was something about that. He just wanted me to see his truth, the truth that had been discounted. He wanted me to see that there was proof that he had this thing in him. And of course, it's kind of, you can take that as sort of representative of, of more than just the splinter, right? Um, but he, uh, and I remember in that moment with him, we just sat there we weren't sitting across from each other, we were sitting next to each other, and we were both just staring at this vial with the splinter in it, just staring at it, and I didn't say anything. And I let him kind of just tell me the story, but that moment, that moment has changed me. That moment changed me ever since. And um, it's not because of anything that I said, it's not because of uh, trying to explain what had happened to him. It was simply just following his narration of something that emerged for him that no one had believed in before. Um, and so I think, that, I think that that is kind of a sign when we feel changed by something. We're going to kind of, and, and if you think again about the, the idea of power, um, and the, the power to name reality and the power to, um, to be a part, to contribute to a discourse, I think that one way of knowing that we're doing the right thing is when we feel, we feel changed by someone else's kind of liberatory experience in the moment where they felt capable of speaking or they felt capable of saying something or defining their own reality in that moment and it impacted us, it impacted us immediately and directly. And um, it, it's, what it is is a previously discounted knowledge suddenly being included. It's an excluded knowledge being coming included knowledge. And uh, this action I think is, um, I believe, as far as I can tell, I believe that 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 is liberatory and that's something that we should try to create as often as possible. And what are the things that we, what are the ways that we obscure that process? The ways that maybe like hundreds and thousands of times that we obscure 
or that we prevent or we tangle this liberation from, from coming. Um, and I think that I really do believe that these, uh, that the jargon and that the, the um, kind of our scripted language in therapy session or our scripted language in, in everyday kind of life, I think really takes up so much room that it doesn't allow that liberation to occur. Okay, and so uh, just in concluding, um, you know, I think we talked, a we talked about uh, the social and psychological impacts of language in Western contexts and in encounters with the other. Um, we examined how language plays an important role within discourse and the ideas of truth-producing truth regimes. And we looked at two examples of two very different um, relationships to language within that, within the encounter with the, with the other. Um, and uh, I think that I, I would just urge us to not underestimate our desire, our pull, to be seduced by the power <laughs> of the truth-producing regime um, that's all but out of our client's reach. So that's it. Thank you. So if there are any questions or comments or discussion that people want to have, now would be the time. Mm -hmm. I guess a conversation that um, it struck me that because I've, for myself I've always I've long considered that the idea of uh, power to be quite similar to uh, for women's, the women's definition. In fact, I really love the side of, of this lecture because for me, uh, the power to define what is what reality. Is, yeah, the, the power to define reality is power. Yeah. Well, experience. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's that goes in many different senses. I think uh, thinking about language in in this uh, in this room is particularly interesting because language is perhaps um, it's a particularly bit potent tool yeah. for that. Because yeah. Because language in itself is devoid of anything without the ability to to kind of interact with, with reality in a sense. Mm -hmm. And I think in in this therapeutic context, uh, from what you say, what I detected was, uh, uh, let's say, using the example of trauma, I think there's power in telling people, okay, this is what this is. But there's also exchange of power because that allows others to say, okay, that's what I experienced, and then I can talk about this. It's like if we're talking about, oh, I saw this other thing, that they always called me, and you tell me what, is, what it is, and I can, it's so much easier for me to tell you what yeah. I experienced. Yeah, it's facilitated. And yeah, and I think this the exchange of power it's probably part of the for the idea that it's not just about kind of steamrolling and overrolling mm -hmm. other people's experience, but to use power to give people power. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, the, the question is, is always like, what happens, what would happen if you hadn't given them? It's, I don't want to say, I'm, I don't, it's really kind of, it is very, for me, it's such an existential crisis because I don't want to say stop saying that something is traumatic or that some, you know, I don't want to erase those terms from my vocabulary and my clinical work, but I don't, but, but now I'm thinking I, like a little extra about the impact and in in the space, the space that that takes up that maybe would have been filled by something else. Maybe like the PTSD or the trauma narrative would have been filled by something else. I'm not, I'm not really necessarily I'm trying to not give it, uh, to, to, to give it a value judgment, but um, I, I think that maybe some people, some people might not um, ultimately find it as useful. I have to imagine that some people wouldn't find those ideas attached to themselves as useful as other people do, because some people certainly do feel very validated by those. But then, as I was saying, the problem is if you don't have if you, if you feel traumatized and you don't have anyone telling you, validating, you know, that's lowercase t, what you said, you know, like, that's, that's not real trauma, then what is that, what is that, then again, I have the power to say what you've experienced does not actually count as trauma, 
And so that's the thing that I'm that concerns me in, in our in this role. But of course, yes, I think that other people can feel empowered and do feel very empowered by saying that they kind of belong to this this um, identity of of, peop- of traumatized. I wonder if the, the alternative is perhaps to look at the psychotherapy as only, I mean, which, which is the reality, as only one of the options, because I mean, one person can, talk, say, can say trauma, and another person can say that was a uh, star sign or I was what? Ghost. Right? I mean, this, uh, because um, I think it's quite normal, natural for us to gravitate towards different kind of language, different kind of metaphor. And like you said, it's the word for everybody, and there's have something else that will work for, for this person right. to achieve what they want to achieve. Right. And I think it's um, from, from our public officer perspective, I guess, it's, uh, it's hard to not to try to solve everybody's problem. Right? But I guess to some points we have to accept that this person's beyond my help. Not that it cannot be helped, but not my particular kind of help. Right. Yeah. I think that uh, that's, I think that um, actually, I, I think it was maybe your friend who's been to a couple of the lectures who did some kind of artistic, like some kind of video project with trauma or something, like a completely, completely outside of the realm of, of, of clinical. And that, whoops, and then I feel, I feel like, um, I feel like the, the possibility of creativity is, is probably one, it's constructive. It literally is creative. Creativity is constructive and it is liberatory. And I think that that as an option for people out, you know, outside of clinical stuff, or maybe in addition to, I think, I, I, I feel like that's, that's the most kind of like really kind of building yourself like whole again compared to what... I think I think that talk therapy is pretty limited in, in some ways, even though I'll do it forever <laughs> for the rest of my life. But <laughs> do you think that you're you meet a lot of different people from different cultures? Do you see that the construct of trauma exists everywhere? Because I think different cultures and realities have different approach to suffering and what it is defining it. And trauma as as such as our language and our construct. Do you meet like people that don't perceive trauma as what we think it is? Like how you approach this? I think uh, the first kind of example that comes to mind is um, some Tibetan people who I worked with, mm-hmm. Tibetan people from Tibet, who had been, you know, as we would call it, like classic torture, you know, like like what you would imagine, physical torture. Um, but there wasn't really, and of course, it's not like everybody is, Tibetans are all one way or anything like that, but I think that the person who I met really didn't have, there, there was no kind of symptoms of like PTSD. Um, she was mostly, she was um, a nun, a Buddhist nun, and she was wanting just basically to be like just to kind of do groups. She was interested in doing group work with other Tibetans, um, but really saw like the trauma was not hers. It was it was just experienced as Tibetans in general. It wasn't her own trauma, and so it. Yeah, I'm not prepared. I don't know how to. I don't. I, that's so outside of the way that I understand trauma healing that um, it was very hard to know. I mean, just I mean, she said she wanted to do group, like be in a group with other Tibetans, so she did group therapy. But that was in the group, and I also participated in the Tibetan group therapy, and that was never really focused on on trauma. It was um, it was so long ago now, actually, but. It was uh, just kind of a, it almost felt like a big, like a big family at, at, at the dinner table or something. It was just a, it was kind of a social, social outlet um, and religious outlet too. But I think that, I, and, and I think that I've also read um, people who are critique, uh, critiques of humanitarian aid that have also said that these things, uh, the, I think it was actually, um, 
this psychological, this research where the psychologists went to Rwanda and they were giving um, um, questionnaires for trauma symptoms. And it was actually the very tiny minority of people who were experiencing trauma, even after like children who were very few of them were experiencing trauma after, after the genocide. Um, so I think that we have to really allow for the fact that think that people might kind of surprise us or, or not kind of follow through in these really clean pictures of trauma leads to such and such, or that it's even trauma at all. I am um, coming from a attachment background and mm -hmm. meditation background, and this is where we look at the narrative and we do an uh, adult attachment interview and we see how the narration goes. And this is like you the, see how the what goes? The narration goes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is like the main thing you look at. And then I was just wondering when you were mentioning that today, uh, last time when we were giving a lecture, I questioned so many things about what we have to yeah. offer. And then now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm there with you. <laughs> I would just like to hear more. What do you think about this way of understanding what is a narrative and how do people talk about trauma? With specifically regarding attachment? Well, whatever was the main focus of yours, mm -hmm. I think we will make a bridge. Um, should we look at the narrative? Should we look at the, at the, tra at the trauma narrative specifically? Yeah. I mean, I want to say, I mean, I want to say, like, yes, of course, um, like, yes and no. Um, I think, let me just see if I can think of an example. I think that, I think that we can look, I think we can, of course, look at the trauma narrative, um, but I think when, um, I think we have to think about our, our own relationship as clinicians with the trauma narrative our interest in the trauma narrative and kind of observing what happens to us internally when we hear a trauma narrative and the pull of the trauma narrative, as opposed to kind of these other things that might be expressed by the client. Kind of, it can kind of, in a way, be like, I th <laughs> I'm thinking of all these absurd metaphors, but like, like a dinner plate, it's like the, it's like the meat and then the other things are like the side dishes. You know, the trauma narrative is, is like the meat of, of the meal. And I think that that's not, I'm starting to question whether, whether that's right, whether that's actually, because if you're talking about, if you're focused on the trauma, I, I think that it's not necessarily um, making the person as, as whole, maybe, as they could be, because that's definitely not the only aspect of their identity. Um, and I actually think that being able to, um, I mean, in narrative exposure therapy, you're supposed to really blend the trauma narrative into like the whole other life, kind of life narrative so that it's just one part of all these different experiences that you've had, and that eventually over time it's not as important. But, um, so yeah, I don't know if that, if that answers your question. It's a good question. So maybe I can tell you how it goes in adult attachment. Yeah. You are asking certain questions, for example, about childhood, and if a trauma has happened, and if a person is talking about the trauma mm -hmm. in a way that is coherent and like you're able to follow, you give higher score. Oh yeah, right, 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 right. So they have been through very difficult uh, situations and they're able to talk about that. Right. And I think, in a way, to me, this makes sense. But at the same time, I would like to go into that a bit further and to understand it with the perspective that you're giving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I think... What are, I mean, I guess my other questions are, what are the other things that they get scored on other than the trauma narrative? And how much weight do those other items have? Um, but uh, I've heard, of, I've heard of, of, of similar things before too, and just kind of like when, when you're seen to be kind of more integrated in a way, if you can talk about, if you can talk in a coherent manner about, about the trauma that you've experienced. But I wonder, if we're not, but then if you think about, like, if you think about artistic, creative expressions, 
of, of anything. I mean, of, they're not linear. They're not always linear. They're not, um, and I think that art kind of gives the freedom to be really messy with any kind of narrative that you want to speak, but there's something about artistic creation that I don't think is, is felt exactly in the same way in therapy. I think, yeah, I think, there, I think there's another process happening for, for somebody um, and that's much more interesting but much more difficult to describe. Anyone else? There should be some laser focus, like I mean, what Marshall is also saying that uh, if the person can express clearly, uh, speak clearly about the trauma, then it's a sign that uh, there is an integration in the person. But you also began by saying that uh, just by speaking of memories, by expressing it to one another, we shape them. Mm -hmm. Changing physically, mm -hmm. we put it back in our head. Right. So there is a contradiction here, or maybe a good contradiction. But uh, what is what does that clarity speak of when we admit that uh, every time we speak about our memories, we express them, they are actually changed. So what is the criteria there of let's say we use a bigger word like health? and not help, mm -hmm. you know, if we recognize that uh, language shreds our memories, you know, in a way. Well, how do you put this together? So the, the laser, you're talking about the laser focus on, on the narrative, on the trauma narrative? Yeah, you mentioned, yeah. Right. It's a little bit of a person who express clearly. You said there is a sign, usually considered as a sign that uh, the trauma is being processed and integrated, and there is a resolution of the trauma. Did I understand well? That yeah, you. D that's an idea. That's an. I that's kind of this. This. Um, this idea by these theorists like Foa and Judith Herman, like these really big names in, in trauma healing, that you have to be able to master the trauma narrative and be able to explain it very, very clearly what happened. Um, and then the other thing that you're bringing up is, is how does that fit with um, the idea of the, the internal working model, like the idea, like the working identity of, of oneself. Well, I, when you were first talking about the, when you, in the first part of your question, you were making me, you were reminding me, of course, that there's definitely the phenomenon where people talk about their trauma with no emotion. So they can be very disconnected, emotionally disconnected from their trauma, but speak about it very flat. And so in a way, that all, that's, a, that's kind of a critique of this, of this laser, fo of, this, of, the, of the importance of the, of the linear narrative. Because if there's no feeling, there's no more feeling with it, it's kind of suggests that someone isn't actually hasn't fully processed like emotionally this experience and then it would and then you might kind of think of um like these other more somatic body kind of creative artistic forms of trauma healing that don't focus on the narrative as much but focus on maybe finding the finding the emotion finding like the even just kind of the the not muscle memory, but the, like this, the way that these experiences are stored physically and kind of integrating maybe all, all of those together. Um, and I wonder what that, I guess, you know, this, this thing I said about the, um, the way that the mind changes, I actually wonder then if the body, if the whole body can change from processing, like in more varied ways, processing trauma, if the body can actually it's not just the brain. Right, the way we speak, what we put out of our mouths about our experience turns back to our minds and bodies as a, to the healing capacity mm -hmm. on the best case scenario. Right. Is that the, the, you know, the, the, the working... Uh, the internal working model? Uh, no, the assumption. The working assumption, no? In the assumption, not in psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. 
the, the talking cure. And uh, also it was yeah. the general, you know. Well, that was, I think, I don't know if I got it right from your, uh, you were saying that it made me think that um, you can go so far as to say that language actually causes healing. Mm -hmm. Or not, you know. But, uh, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to maybe go very far by saying that, like, take me to Lacan. <laughs> so, um, what would you say about it? Is that, uh, you know, it's like, the effects of language, of expressing the experience, are the ones who actually um, are the human, to be the human. It, I mean, it, I do believe, I do believe that language, that language can, is a healing medium. It can be. Um, I think, I think it's, it's this, kind of thing where like I so was it you who said it maybe that language is it's not bad or good it's 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 neutral it but it can be used in a lot of different ways it can be used destructively or creatively um so but I I think I think that um I I mean I of course I I do believe that it's just kind of that that words can be healing I just I'm just trying to think um how do we know that we're kind of going in the right direction? How do we know that healing is happening? Not just by the presence of, okay, we're in a therapy session, we're talking, okay, healing must be happening. What is it about that therapy session? What are the ingredients that are allowing healing to happen? It's, it's not just, I mean, I guess that's kind of like a really general way of responding to that, but I, I also really, I, I'm very, very aware of the limits of language in healing, in healing trauma. Um, I, I, I've, I've, worked with, I've worked with a lot of people who've been very severely traumatized and language is, is very limited, in my opinion, is very limited in that kind of work. Um, but then, these uh, just because for for various reasons because sometimes people aren't even ca cognitively capable of holding on to what's happening in the session or even focusing on you, like they're distracted um, by by memories or they're distracted by maybe a brain injury depending on how badly they were hurt. Um, so, and then how do you work with those people who who can't really use language that way? Because not everybody, not everybody feels. I think a, maybe a lot of like a lot of us, maybe we feel pretty comfortable with language, but not everybody who has especially been traumatized, like as children or whatnot, feel that they have language at their disposal. That it's really a tool for them. So then, how do you do that? How do you work with them? And yeah. I mean. Um, I did work on a team. It wasn't a good team. Um, but it, I worked with a psychiatrist who was very, who was n not, not very humanistically oriented. Um, but I think, I think that, um, I, I think that there, there were, um, I mean, this, this one person who basically had very, very limited, uh, she couldn't really read. She, she stopped going to school when she was about 14 years old. Um, she had a very poor memory. She just couldn't really, I think she may have also had a learning disability. Um, she, the only thing, we were together for two years, every week, and the only thing she could kind of hold on to from our work together, which was really important, but it was the only thing she could hold on to was this idea that I didn't tell my mother about the sexual, I didn't tell my grandmother about the sexual abuse because I wanted to, I wanted to, to keep her alive because this person said that he would have killed her. And so the only thing she kind of got from two years of work together was I protected my grandmother, I saved her life. And that was the only thing that she could, that was the only thing she could retain. But that was a miracle that she could retain that. But there was no, I, tr I tried so many times to draw what PTSD is and like explain this construct. It didn't, it was never, I, I, I think probably not important to her. <laughs>
in the end, probably not. It was important to me to tell her that she had PTSD so that she could understand that. But I, I disagree with that now, that my decision to really focus on that so much. Other, there was something else that was important to her. She, was, she, she, she rescued her grandmother. That was the most important thing to her. And then you do what you can, you know, like you do what you can for, for, for her and for everyone. <laughs> Yeah. Say again. I probably. I I maybe I think that accompaniment was probably something more than what I did. Um, maybe there are elements of accompaniment in there, but um, I think it, I think I was very much pushing my own agenda in that session with her, where I, I wanted to. She had she had symptoms. She was very very what I would say you know debilitated by PTSD symptoms, um, and I wanted her to live a fuller life. I wanted her to overcome these symptoms. Um, and for her to do that, I felt like she needed to understand what the symptoms were, but she couldn't. And so I, I, I just, it was very, what I could do with her was very, was, was this much of what I wanted to do for her. And I, and I just, I don't know if that's a compliment exactly. Maybe that's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, next week I'm talking about a um, and that's kind of this pretty radical, very non-clinical kind of idea, um, but I could have done, I could have done more, I could have done better with her in that way, but I was, I just needed her, I needed her to grasp onto this, to grasp onto this trauma idea, but you know, all this stuff is kind of, it's, it's helping me kind of rethink all that, that focus that I had. What about her feedback to, or her perception of progress or healing in that time, like, that should also signal you that you probably achieved something in that two years now? Yeah, I think, I, think, I think that was achieved because that, it was very hard for her to form new, new ideas. Um, I, I think, I think that, I asked her once, do you, you know, where are you, like, where do you feel you are? Do you feel like you're all here? And she's like, no, I'm in a thousand different spaces. I'm, th I'm a thousand different, cut up into a thousand pieces. I'm not all here. Um, and so I think that, I think that she, I think that was, I mean, and then, I mean, I think that I basically, it was kind of this, I maybe partly accurate empathy, the idea of accurate empathy too, where you're really, sensing and understanding something fundamental about somebody and you're able to you know present it to them in an understandable way and if it's really accurate to their experience then then it really does get incorporated into into their I guess I could just say an internal working model of the self like it it, it comes in there and that was a positive one you know it was she she did something she wasn't just a victim she 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 saved her her grandmother's life Anyone else? Tends to, to ask kind of a bit like, well, actually, it's really good morning. <laughs> Whether you suffer from PTSD, uh, <laughs> the T in this case being this entire experience <laughs> of having to be in this position and deal with the T. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, I think. I, and, and patients ask me that all the time. They're like, how are you dealing with this? How are you listening to these stories all the time? And um, I think that, I, th I think that I just, I, this is going to sound maybe corny, and it's not because it's also not like, I thought about this before, but I think it's, um, I, I believe I believe in, in, in liberation. I believe in people's capacity for liberation. And that's stronger than anything. That's stronger than the trauma. It's stronger than the pain. Like it's, to me, it's, it's, it's I believe in it with everything, with all of me. I really appreciate that. 
but that's uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so what I'm curious about is a bit different from, from what I hear. I've heard uh, quite a few of the stories so far. Uh, yeah. The trauma that insofar as I can identify in your place is mm -hmm. the, the realization that what you're doing is not helping. Oh, the and trauma. Oh. Right. And I, I find, for, for me personally, I would find that much more traumatic other than sharing traumatic stories. That's, that's the confrontation I will have in your place with myself about my powerlessness. And I think that's trauma is to me somehow very much related to powerlessness. Mm. Uh, mm. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think hearing people's horror stories is it's not this, it's not your experience in some ways. You know, it's a, it's I mean we, I guess we we go in with the understanding that whatever we hear has already happened. There may be things you wish to do, but you're not made powerless on the spot. As a life, we, as a therapist, you're actually there and you're as in, as the, the tools that you have seems in that inadequate. That would be, that would feel, that for me, that feels traumatizing. Somehow. Yeah. I think. I think I guess the like, the first thing that comes to mind is just persisting even though you're powerless. Keep there's nothing there's nothing that you you can't take you can't fix the trauma. You don't have the power to fix the to to you know. I I would never I could work with her for 10 more years. I wouldn't have the power to to this person I'm talking about. I wouldn't have the the expertise or the skill to heal her trauma, um, but it's, um, I, th I think that just, I think that maybe that is kind of, maybe that is kind of accompaniment in a way, like you were saying, is not necessarily trying to solve something, but being in their presence, and that's, that's really, that's, that's a lot. Giving, giving somebody your presence um, and not having, even, even knowing that you're not going to ever come to the destination, but that you're going to be, you're going to be with them despite not achieving goals, therapeutic goals. And then that's, that's it. It's very, it is humbling, but I think it's also showing that there's something, there's something about the, about the relationship that, that, that's important, um, independent of the, the trauma itself. That reminds me of some, something you were talking about earlier that uh, I didn't really jump into it. It's about the idea of uh, where the language is healing and uh, what you can provide healing. And uh, when you talk about it, I realized I kind of tend to have more of a phenomenological background in terms of training. And uh, I tend to see this configuration slightly differently. Because I think the underlying assumption is that, let's say, I don't know, standard tissue trauma case, right, torture, whatever it is, um, we, are, we, we assume that something happens to you physically, changes something, something happens in your mind. And I think if we go by that assumption, uh, it's, and also the, the, real, the fact that there are people experiencing the same, you know, physical experience without the same kind of trauma. So something's happened here inside that we don't understand the mechanics of, and I don't think anyone has the real means. We have all these models and theories, but nobody really knows the underlying mechanics. But we can observe that uh, external effects has internal implications, and vice versa. And if we go by that assumption, then it's for me it's obvious or at least necessary to think that language does heal. I mean, maybe not heal, but does something that can be together. And again, I think the, the core mechanics of healing, again, nobody understands, but that's something that's going to happen inside. And what we can do, or we hope to do, is to do something that catalyzes that healing. And which is, I think, in the, the last story you shared, it's a good example, right? Because I think in the story where, uh, was the last one? No, two no, weeks. No. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. No, 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 no. today. Um, oh, okay. The one about uh, when the trans interpreter went offline. And, and then there was a moment of healing, nevertheless. Yeah. Uh, could that have, have happened without any interpreter at all? I, I'm not sure, I kind of doubt it. But I think there's a, 
language does serve this catalytic function to you know trigger something else. And I think so much of therapy is really kind of poking around the bushes, trying to get at the healing that none of us understand. But yeah, we we try to approach that, and I think it's. Uh, I'm not so pessimistic about therapy as maybe I guess maybe not either, but um, I think it's uh, just we don't just because we don't see exactly how everything works doesn't mean we're not doing anything. I think you're right. I think it is very mysterious how healing happens, and often you know you hear that healing happens years after the therapy is over. You know, and all those processes aren't recorded, and they're not, they aren't all, they aren't very well understood. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I still, I still have, I still have faith in talk therapy. I just feel that, um, I feel that for some people it really needs, I feel that, I feel that somatic and creative um, and artistic modes of expression really are under underused and under under understood, not well understood um, by people like me. Um, and I, 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 it just becomes I, you know, and always at the end of the day, like your your patients, your clients are are teaching you. Like if you listen and you reflect well enough, they're teaching you everything that you need to know about what you're doing. Um, and I mean, they've taught me more than I could ever really, really pursue. I, they've taught me things like things that they need that I, I could never do all the things that they, I could never be all the things that they need me to be. Or I couldn't even facilitate all the different processes I, that I believe they need. It has to be really, it does have to be like a team, a team approach if you have a good team. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answered your question or if you had a question. Yeah, Just a conversation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I do find that to your last point about how somatic and artistic therapies are uh, underused, under understood. I think that's, that has to be the case because the nature of language, in that we think we understand things when we can verbalize it when we can write things down. And we, we simply don't have the tools to, to think we understand things that we cannot express. We don't have, at least we don't have means to communicate mm -hmm. what we understand. So that, I think that's just that's an artifact of our understanding. And I think it's possible to reach some kind of understanding, but that would make it remain very difficult to communicate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the domain of a lot of art, right? That some people understand it or whatever. That's a, it's, I, I, I think it's, uh, we will always come up short if we try to measure things against language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree. What about other people, I think, did you want? Or... <laughs> yes. Weren't you talking about um, working with a young girl, a little girl who wasn't talking, and then she got some... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. This, another anecdote, I'll try to say it quickly. Also, also like when I think of her, I'm, I'm like, I feel, I feel like goosebumps. Um, she, yeah, she was, she was seven. And her experience was that she, she was in Brooklyn. And when she was like four years old, she was walking, she was black. And she was walking with uh, her uncle to the grocery store. And her uncle was shot and killed by police officers, which, you know, is not uncommon in the U.S. Um, for black people to be killed by police. Um, and she was, but she was there when he was killed at that young age. And then she, she had just had difficulty. She was, her family was also homeless, so there's a lot of instability. But she came in for therapy, and we, I was trying to talk with her, and she would not, she just wouldn't respond to me. Like she wouldn't, and kids actually teach you so much about being a therapist. Um, so she wouldn't respond. She just wouldn't, there was no like traditional way of like engaging her um, using words, even compared to other kids who could talk a little bit. Um, but then one day she was, and she'd kind of come to therapy and she'd just be like, <laughs> 
she'd be like this, like her posture was like this. And so one day I just kind of imitated her and I sat like that in front of her. And then she knew right away, she was like, oh, you're imitating me. You're, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're watching me, you're paying attention to me. And so we just started, almost without even describing what we were doing, we started playing this, this game called Mirror that I learned from theater when I was a kid. And uh, where we would just basically spend the entire session, I would just mimic everything that she did. And it basically just gave her, and she just kind of, she became so animated and so like cheery and, and, and bright and like suddenly energetic. And I think, that, I think that it was because, you know, this is obviously nonverbal, and I think it was because um, she felt, there was something experiential where she, um, felt that she was being seen. It was just the experience of being seen. And I worked with her for a year, and I just feel like that, that was her therapy, you know, for, from age seven to eight. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Did you have a question? Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I was just curious to how I understand liberation, since there was so much talk about it. Say, say it again. Liberation. Liberation. I think um, I think it's when uh, when people I want to say like one obvious example is when people find when people find the, the words to express something that, hasn't, that has, hasn't been expressed before and that it um, kind of flows, it's, a, it's kind of a flowing process where they're not really, they're not so thinking about what they're saying or what they're expressing, but it's kind of a moment of like allowing, allowing what's been repressed and suppressed, allowing it to kind of, in a therapy session specifically, allowing it to, to emerge in not just, you know, in language, of course, language, but also I think um, in just kind of allowing, allowing the person to kind of, allowing the patient or the client to kind of move around the room in the way that they want to, like if they're talking about something that... Am I... Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, does, that, uh, does that only mean that they have to express or like be able to retell their trauma, or does it mean that there's more to that than simply sharing their story? Um, I, think, I think that... Um, I don't think it necessarily has to be telling the, describing the trauma. I think it, it's kind of like finding, sh being in a moment with someone where they're finding maybe a piece of them, themselves that had been, a piece of themselves that they, that they care about and is important to them that hasn't been accessible for a long time. And then they're able to access that again. Um, and you're able and you're witnessing that. So it's not just that they're kind of alone in their own room, kind of remembering something about themselves, but they're showing you something and you're able to, to witness it. I think that that, like the social context is really important, but I don't think it necessarily... It wouldn't necessarily be a certain moment. It would be like the whole process. Um... I don't have a really easy answer to your question, I'm finding. I think, I think that it's, I think that um, it, for me, like the way that I, the way that I think of it is they are kind of moments. They're specific moments in therapy where someone is feeling in touch with a source of their own power, whatever they feel that power to be, um, they're feeling in touch with it. And that it doesn't last forever. Sometimes it can just be like a window. Um, and they're not kind of in this state of like elated, like, you know, liberation. Usually it doesn't, it doesn't feel that way. But I think, I think it's kind of, 
like I mean, even if you think about people um, like out on the streets protesting or something, I think those are also moments of of liberation that just basically have to do with, I believe, have to do with this going from something being repressed to something emerging to something being allowed to be to be spoken and shared, kind of like the 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 excluded the excluded narrative suddenly being heard. I think that there's that's and, and I think that, that there's something to do with that, but I don't think I have a very like clear answer to your question. Did you want to ask a follow up? myself from that angle and noticed your whole, uh, the way you constructed the presentation, the language, but like more of uh, you being the main actor in liberation rather than I always saw it as a supporting role rather than the therapist rather than the actor. So like the, so the therapist being taking on the liberation? No, the therapist being as you, you help your patient mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. You only provide them with certain tools, and it's them who actually have to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think. Yeah. So. I think so. I think so because I, I. I. I don't like. There's this phrase like you can't teach insight. You can't teach somebody insight. They have to have it themselves for it to be true insight. And I think that that somehow relates to this question of, you know, you can't, you, I can't liberate someone else really in saying, oh, you know, there's nothing wrong with being gay, you know, and then that person's like, oh, you know, great, like, I'm, suddenly I'm, I'm I don't ever have to feel, feel this way ever again, like, I, I, that, that's completely unrealistic. And so it has to somehow, as the therapist, you have to kind of, you have to just you're, you're the supporting you're the supporting yeah totally yeah i love that exactly yeah um i think that that's and then they get to claim that they get to claim that for themselves they found their way there they they took the last step it's like this whole kind of trope of the hero's journey like this um you can kind of accompany them to an extent and then they have to kind of go the rest of the way themselves and then, you know, that's their liberation, that's their healing or whatever it is. But that's, it's, maybe that's a totally Western, again, like a completely Western way of thinking about liberation. Probably is. But should you be perceived as like easing suffering <laughs> in this case? Like you, you need to come to a point where your, your permanent suffering or your very like, you know, punctual suffering eases. That's when you feel the liberation of Whatever it's like, trauma type you. I wonder if being yeah. authentic. Or Say again. Being authentic or finding pieces in you that were hidden. Yeah. Is partially. I think, I think, I, I like that idea too, just kind of something that's not monumental, but something that's just you. Like you've discovered, you've found something that is an aspect of who you are that's really yours and doesn't come from anywhere else. I think. That's kind of, yeah, I like, I like that because it doesn't have to be these dramatic, these dramatic moments of, you know, of growth. They can be kind of small, just claims of, of like, of who you, who you truly are, of your identity. And actually, I think, like, like the example with the, the person feeling like she saved her grandmother, you know. Um, should we maybe have one more question and then, and then wrap up? All right, we done? Okay, great, thanks.